to the 12th session and last session of this amazing journey that we took together studying the book Plenitude. In one way, it's, um, um, I'm not going to say sad, but um, it, it's, a, it's a closing chapter, right, of the book. And we always, when we finish a book, when we should finish something, it's always like, oh, it was so nice, the things that we learned and all. But it leads us into something else, right? We want more. Because the questions that I was asking and I would like to pose to one another uh, about this book is that, do we feel plentiful? Are we free of our problems? Can we find solutions for our problems? Uh, or can we find a solution for the problem of our brothers and sisters? Quite frankly, no. <laughs> it's not that easy, right? It's not that easy just because we read uh, 14 chapters or that we study 14 chapters that we find solutions for everything or that we free from our, the, the difficulties that we have in our lives. Why? Because many of the difficulties that we have today have been implanted in our lives and rooted uh, or inrooted, if we can say that way, over and over and over through millennia. Different lives, different situations. If we can find a difficulty in dealing with one issue of our lives that is, quote unquote, a new issue, right? And we kind of resonate on it. We marinate on it and we relive it over and over and over. Imagine some of the greater issues that we have. It must be from the past. So no, we don't have the answers for our problems yet. But one thing that we know, we have some tools. We have some tools throughout the 14, ch 14 chapters. Joanna DeAngelis have bring, brought us um, several tools, several ways for us to um, at least analyze our, our issues and, and focus on what is important as well. Projecting us more than ever into the future because this is one of the um, greatest aspect of, of spiritism. Um, but going back to what we're saying, we don't, have the issue, we don't have the answers yet. And I say this with a good heart, um, acknowledging our, our, let's say, our, that we are not well evolved yet and that's why we're here, here. That's why we're here. And that's why we keep coming back, right? Because we need to be reminded over and over and over what um, the reasons why we're here. So what were the 14 tap chapters? As we can see here, we analyze all these things, suffering, an analysis of suffering, the origins of suffering, the end of suffering, approaches to end suffering, altruism, causes of suffering, pathways to health, the process of self-healing, obsession therapy, alternative therapies, suffering in the face of death, suffering in the face in the afterlife, and tonight, finally, the release from suffering. Joanna the Angel in this chapter, she kind of puts everything into perspective that we study, and I will try to remember or bring to light some of the chapters and some of the things that we study. Um, but I'll continue to go back and say, please read it. <laughs> Truly read it. Take the book and read it. For those of you who uh, can read Portuguese, I believe, I haven't uh, checked yet, and I do apologize for it, but I believe it's online, and you can actually download the PDF. I do have the book in Portuguese as well. Um, and it, 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 at times, uh, I, I kid you not, I go back to the Portuguese version and I take a look at it. Well, let me see what's saying, you know, we compare apples to apples. And sometimes, you know, it sinks in a little bit better. I'm not an expert in English yet. And we try to do our best with what we have. But it's quite a lot of information. I have to say that with the studies as well, and I'm putting myself into perspective in terms of um, the difficult level of the book, um, that I haven't really uh, grasped everything and I haven't dived into what I think that we can dr dive in terms of knowledge, information. Um, just taking one part of, as, as an example of the book, um, the Buddhist ideals that she brings. You know, it's very minuscule what I was able to go after and understand, right? 
because there is also another aspect that I think we need to dive and exercise a little bit more uh, from the Buddhist teachings is the meditation piece. I think it's an, uh, an amazing piece that we have to take them more in consideration. So I'm just taking this and saying, that is really when we, if, you know, if we give ourselves the ability to read and dive into it, let's really try to dive into it because it's really helpful. So what does she say um, in this amazing chapter, Release from Suffering? Given the infinite range of suffering that afflicts human beings, the purpose of deep psychotherapy is to root out its causes. We, she goes back to uh, you know, the things that we went over and over and over in several of the chapters. Number one, in order for you to root out the cause of a problem or affliction, you have to understand it. In order for you to understand it, what do you have to do? We have to face it. We can brush it off. We can push it aside. We have to go after and say, okay, what's the problem? What's causing it? And it's interesting that when you try to um, get into the root cause of the problem, especially when you're dealing with your, yourself, it's something that you need to take care of in, within yourself. It's easy when we have to analyze something in other people. But when we, ha when we have to go back in ourselves, we tend to find uh, excuses, right? Ways to get off of it. Really face it. Let's really face it. What's causing this? How do I treat it? Ask for help. Because it's hard for us to tell what we're doing wrong. But there are some friends <laughs> that they can easily say, Lee, are you doing this wrong? Right? And we kind of like tend to stay away from those individuals because we want to hear what we want to hear. So ask for help. But we need to root out. To get to the root cause of it, we really have to understand it. We he really have to face it. And I think Joanna DeAngelis, through the titles, we can see through the titles, she really pushes us to um, understand the root, the, the root cause of our problems. As we remember, we go back to chapter two, the noble truth by Buddha, right? Suffering, which is understanding what suffering is, its origins, the end of suffering, and the path to liberation from suffering. It's amazing when we connect this with the uh, the pathways the um, to liberate um, to liberate ourselves from suffering that we go through the eight pathways and we're going to see them later on again just to revisit them. How the proposal is to get to know ourselves by every little action through meditation, for example, which is the way that they propose, and we, we'll see this again to really dive into what we're doing right now. If, you, if I had to ask you, and if you had to focus on what are you doing right now, it goes like this. Every word that I say, you are following and you're repeating to yourself. I'm paying attention to a talk. I'm paying attention to a talk. I'm paying attention to a... If you are finding this meditative state in whatever, I'm washing dishes, and you say to yourself, I'm washing dishes, and I know that I'm washing this. I recognize that I'm washing dishes. At first, when I started diving to the idea and doing a little bit, I was like, wow, this is, I shouldn't say stressful, but um, it, it really brings us to the state of the now. And if you have an, you, you, you use the same technique to understand your, your problem, guess what? I know Paul is like, yes, I love the idea, <laughs> right, Paul? But you try to under, you, you try to say, okay, I'm feeling this way. I'm feeling sad. And you say to yourself, I'm feeling sad. Why am I feeling sad? And then you start you know, going back and really diving over and over and over. And this is something that we can do in the future with some help, hopefully. Because if Joanna DeAngelis is bringing this topic in our lives through this book to find plenitude, I think we ought to give it a chance at least and really exercise this idea. But that's the idea, that we really dive within ourselves to find the root cause of it. That's why I put this reminder here about Buddha. And then she continues in this chapter. Since suffering is a sickness, there are several effective ways to cure it. Some attenuated, others are harmless, but very few are indisruptively effective. I'm sorry, this is chapter four. A real cure, however, can only occur if the therapy uproots its causes. As long as it's generating sources are not extinguished, suffering inevitably manifests. 
Because the misuse of reason is what causes it, it is essential to get to the heart of its trigger so as to stop the energy that activates and vitalizes it. These, this, this is actually um, in chapter four, these three paragra paragraphs right here. So the misuse of energy, the misuse of thoughts, the misuse of um, the, 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 that life that is granted to us brings us to this state. And we, we can remem remind ourselves as well that this is not a negative thing per se, it's because of our ignorance. So in a way, yes, we have done something wrong, but it's because we don't know any better. And only through the analysis of the self, through the analysis of who we are and where we want to be, right, that we will be able to understand this and grant ourselves a better life. And this is in any aspect of our lives. We'll see an, an amazing example later on. But this is any aspect of our lives. At work, at home, with ourselves. I think this is the most important part. How we deal with ourselves. How we accept ourselves. And how we envision ourselves to be. And that's what we need to do. We really need to um, create a habit of analyzing ourselves. We study that suffering can come, uh, can be generated from these three points. Suffering from suffering. Whether you're going through in the moment, you suffer because we know that, guess what? Life is not easy. But it's not for us to take to the point that I was born to suffer. Please, let's not think that way. That's not what it is. We are in the flesh, we are in the planet Earth. It's not a happy planet as we learn with spiritism. But it's not for, it was not we are not meant to suffer. And we have, we study as well on how to change our perception towards that idea. Sometimes there is the suffering that is to come. Some people worry about age, right? My God, what's going to be? What's going to happen? The teenagers, they suffer from things. <laughs> Anxiety is just slow down one day at a time, one day at a time. If I have to worry about what's going to happen next month, ooh, gosh, it's, it's troubling, right? Next year, 2020. Oh, my Lord. It's already 2020, right? And so, so be it. It's another day. It's another year. It's another month. We aspire for the good things. We worry about the things that are, that are, that are up to come. But, hey, um, it, it, life goes on. Suffering from impermanence. This is really tough, right? We saw that... The acceptance of change, which is the only constant in our lives, right? The change, everything changes, everything transforms, right? It's really hard. And that is in terms of material things. That is in terms of the impermanence of ourselves here on the physical body with one another. Losing this person, losing that. Losing or not even receiving the acceptance of others. The suffering from impermanence really hurts. Suffering from re suffering resulting from conditionings, the expectancy that we put on things, the idea that I will get this product if I do this, and sometimes madness comes along because we keep repeating the same thing over and over and over, expecting the same result, and when we don't get it, we suffer. Just for us to recapitulate real uh, briefly here, uh, some of the chapters, some of the concepts that we saw, that. We need to get to the root of these things. We need to face it. In addition to the entire ethical and moral contribution that mitigates suffering and alters its casualty, producing wholesome causes for the future, medical care when dealing with issues in the area of physical health, and psychological care when treating alienated behavior or personality conflicts are extremely important. What did we see? The different therapies, alternative ter therapies. And we go over again later on with some other aspects that she brings to us. Um, we saw the treatment at the Spiritus Center, right? It's important. But she's saying again, science is out there for us to go back and say, I need help. Whatever the type of suffering, its claw causes wounds in telling a pro, pro, uh, protracted, 
degenerative um, process that sometimes leads to delusion, folly, and arbitrariness, especially in, the in individuals devoid of moral resistance. This is a point where we, we really have to be careful um, that so we're not, we're not judging to ourselves and to others. It is true what she's saying, but we have to understand that morality, as much as the different types of education or whatever point uh, we would like to explore, um, is subjective. Subjective in the sense of what's what I consider, consider morality, right? Or something moral, an action that is a moral action is completely different from any of us here. We have our standards because we live in the same society. We um, abide to the same laws, but it's not everybody. Everybody's not this at the same level, right? And we have our difficulties with certain points. And we can go, we can dive in whatever it is, but at least we, we have to be, I think we need to be uh, cautious that when we are treating something within ourselves, we also ask ourselves, what kind of resistance do I have? Well, the moral resistance may not be as strong as I'm supposed to have because I don't understand it. I haven't yet analyzed what the, the, my moral standard is. Or when we're dealing with others, we see it the same way. And we're not, we don't have to go into um, you know, a uh, like code of law, basic things sometimes, right? Because sometimes we're dealing with certain individuals that what we think that is basic, guess what, for them, doesn't exist. It doesn't exist. That's why when last time when we were um, analyzing the, the, our, our connections, we say what? We, we said that it's important that we draw the line in certain areas because you, we know our limitations, or at least we should know our limitations. So if we want to maintain a well-leveled relationship with others, it's okay to say it. Look, I don't like to go into that area. I don't like to do certain things. Some people may be afraid to say it because they think that we ought to, you know, make everybody happy. Or some people may not like to hear such a thing because we think, oh, this person is strange. No, well, it's, I'm glad that the person is saying because at least I know how to relate with that individual. I don't relate the same way with Alba the way I relate with Jeanette. Because I know the way that some people like to be hugged. Some other people, they don't like to be hugged. <laughs> don't hug me, <laughs> you know? It can be a cultural thing. So all these things, it's important for us to take in, this in perspective. As she mentioned, as we promised that we would bring it here, a century ago, centuries ago, Buddha recommended an eightfold path for salvation. These eight path, these eight steps are indispensable for enlightenment through love and plenitude through happiness. And they are believing, believing rightly, wanting rightly, talking rightly, operating rightly, living rightly, correct effort, thinking rightly, meditating rightly as well. This is not only for ourselves, but this is, um, these are, are, are steps that gives us the ability to relate with one another in a different way not expecting a change on other individuals, but how we relate with them. And that will make us, at least help us uh, live better. It's interesting that when I went, uh, when I went a little bit deeper into these, these steps, um, the, the reference that I got, the references that I got, and the, the study led me to um, several uh, different new habits once we start to um, analyze and really um, uh, apply this, these things in our lives. For example, believing rightly as we saw. I have to believe that I'm capable if I want something. If I want a change, if I don't believe, nobody's going to do it for me. Our necessities that we have to do every single day. Sleep, eat, sleep, do whatever we have to do. If I don't do it for myself, if I don't believe that I'm capable of, guess what? And it's the same thing when we're talking about the moral changes the struggles that we have to face it. We can hold someone's hands and we go, but the person still have to face it. It's the same thing with us. Normally, its intensity is felt according to the sensitivity of 
those who experience. In the physical arena, there are sufferers endowed with a high tolerance for pain, but who fail, disheartened when the suffering is of an emotional nature. The reverse is also true, consecrating heroes of almost unbelievable endurance under the yoke of terrible thorns embedded in the tissue of the soul. We quite often see guys, for example, I don't cry, right? I'm the tough man, right? Or well, I'm the tough person, you know. But there are certain things that no matter how tough the person is, it will bring the person down to their knees. So it, we don't even find a perfection on this side. So if we think, or if we find ourselves thinking that, oh, I can deal with this. This is very easy. I, I know. Or be tough. Well, everybody have their weak points. Some we see, as she's saying here, individuals who are tough with, you know, issues of the physical body. We believe that's a tough cookie, right? That, you know, a person goes through many things in life, endure, but when it comes to emotional issues or even emotional balances or balance, um, we see that the person is not well. And sometimes it's exactly what is causing some of the issues in the physical body too. So we really have to analyze. And the, the idea of the intensity with with our experience, according to our, you know, how evolved we are, it is also true. If we mistreat an animal over and over and over, a dog, for example, what's going to happen? After the third, fourth, fifth time, just by getting near, the dog is going to bark. <laughs> it's not going to like it. Because the idea is what? Something's coming towards me. And imagine ourselves. We probably have done this over and over and over with the things that we don't like, but we never expressed ourselves when it started. And we let go, and we let go, and we let go. And then what happens? When somebody comes to us to say hello, we bark. <laughs> we don't say hello back. We don't say good morning back. We become that sour individual. But if we evolve from that situation, saying, okay, maybe, yes, the past was tough. Now I'm a different person. I'm going to say good morning back. It's going to be tough, but I'm going to say good morning back. And this is something that it, it has to do with us wanting it and really striving it to change. Suffering is closely related to individuals' spiritual process, as we have been saying. Broad sensitivity endows them with greater emotional depth, which responds to anguish and inner conflicts without complaints or accusations suffers, silence their pain, and let themselves be torn inwardly, especially when they experience emotional afflictions due to betrayal, injustice, cruelty, abandonment, and loneliness. We need to evolve. We need to understand the difficulties that others are facing as well. Um, recently, um, I something just dawned on me because we did not we did not know at the time at work where an individual would come in and this is this probably happened um it's hard to count but at least five or six times that the customer came to see us at work and the person was never pleasant never pleasant and always grumpy and the responses were sour and we came to find out about two weeks ago that the person was battling um, a problem with his back. And it's funny because some of you know the situations with the back with me as well. And then I was, I, I was able to change. I never really, you know, thought negatively about the individual because it's like, well, it's the way the person is. I mean, you know, it's, what, do you, what can you do? You're not going to sit down and be the, you know, the, the person to help because this is not the appropriate time and whatever. But you were, I was able to connect with the person a different way. Now he's better because he actually had back surgery as well, but he was always grumpy. And I was able to understand, now I see. Sometimes we don't know, right, what the person is going through. Um, we can kind of put ourselves in their shoes, or but you still don't know. Or somebody is missing someone, or the person is going battling something else that we don't know. So it's really important for, for us not to take part on it, as well as um, to change 
our emotional uh, sensitivity uh, that we don't get connected. If they have religious faith and transmute the trial for their spiritual future, future, they endure its cutting blades in a balanced way, overcoming the difficult situation and themselves, and exiting the crisis with greater maturity and peace. Lengthy illnesses beautify their character and endow them with even more loving feeling, which overflow with kindness. I'll stop right here because there is more, but it's important for us to take this aspect of spiritism that we always look for the future because we know that we are mortal beings. And once we're able to say, okay, how is this situation right now can help me, not only in the now, but in the future as well. One thing is for sure, if we don't resolve it now, we're gonna carry over <laughs> to some other time, right? If we don't face the situation now, chances are we'll have to see it later on. It's like that dust that you know you, you, you sweep to the corner. It's gonna stay there. If you don't vacuum and you don't throw the content inside of the vacuum out, it's gonna stay there. And it's gonna smell, it's gonna pile up with the other content that is gonna be thrown on top of it. So if we take that and say, I'm gonna deal with this right now because I want to grow. And I wanna make sure that in the future, even though I may face the same situation or something similar, at least I have the knowledge of how to deal with it. Because chances are, we'll see it again on Earth, right? <laughs> if we're doing with some difficulties as, as she mentioned, we'll see it again because we're not perfect yet. And sometimes it will be caused by the same individuals or by ourselves, by ourselves again. So let us project ourselves into the future. If anything, how can I change this? And how will this change me in the future to be a better person? It's not easy, I know. That's why we said at the beginning, this is a really a long trial for us to master it. When illnesses strike those who are less evolved, it brutalizes them and hardens the very core of the sentiments which had been developing in a beneficial direction. Because of its complex cultural, scientific, moral, and religious structure, spiritism is the doctrine capable of solving the issue of suffering, setting its victims free. I brought the, uh, the the, the two candles there, not in, as a religious symbol or anything like that, but it's something for us to remember that if, if we, uh, the, the, the analogy of the light, right? The light never, it's not afraid to be. And this is when I read these, these three paragraphs, I was thinking the light is not afraid to be. If we were to have two similar candles, um, or if we make the, Right now, if we were to take the white behind the, the screen right here and make it black, and we only had these two candles over here with the lights on, there's no difference. There's no difference whatsoever. Now, if we were to turn the lights off and we have the picture of these two candles only here, it will be much brighter here if we didn't have the light. What I'm trying to say is that we have our essence. We have our light within ourselves. It may be small as the two candles over here, but we are already lighting up. We are already energy. We receive energy. We multiply energy, right? And with the elements that we have here, um, the study of spiritism, the religious faith that we already have from many, many, many centuries, millennia, right, that we have received, we can count here in different walks and paths of life, what we have lived already, especially in the Christian faith, and why we're not using well. Why we're not really exploring the light that we already have with the teachings that we're receiving now to face certain difficulties in life. So I think we need to um, rethink about these elements and if there is a need for us to use of these symbols that 
sometimes can be a little bit of a religious symbol, sometimes scary for some, right? Um, it's okay. It's okay. Chapter 9. What are, these are, I was going to ask, I was going to quiz everyone. <laughs> what did we do in chapter 9? What did we say? But I brought this here because this is something that also goes in conjunction with our um, daily um, work for us to evolve. And it has to do with self-healing as well. Number one, observing one's thoughts and their preferred content in order to radiate positive, healthy energy. We want to radiate light. We want to radiate goodness. We want to light up the room. Not to be flashing. Everybody's like, oh, Leo got here. No. <laughs> but to people, to, to transmit that confidence that someone is in the room who's going to add to my ideals. Right? And we do that to our environment at home. We do that to our environment at, at work, at school. Someone who can add value. So we need to observe our thoughts and what is important for us. Number two, keeping mental attunement with the source of power. It's amazing when we ask someone to say a prayer and the person's like, oh, I don't know. I don't know. Well, talk to God. Why do you talk to God? You know? And I had that fear too. So don't think that I, I didn't. I did have that fear. I remember the... The, the, the first years of our study group, our, before we even became a society and all, when I had to say a prayer, it was, it was not easy. <laughs> and we learn, we develop. In, in some instance, people thought twice before they asked me to say the prayer because I'm too long, I take too long, I go into this deep conversation with God, but it's okay too, it's all right too. Resting, a healthy diet, hygiene and keeping acti activities in order. It may come as a no-brainer for some of us, but sometimes things get so difficult that we forget to do these things. We do it because the, the sake of, of having to do it, but we don't intentionally do it. What I'm trying to say is the following. When we are taking care of ourselves, think about it. Truly think about it. Okay, I'm going to take a shower. What is a shower for? Just to cleanse the skin? No, use the water for something else. Let it wash all the impurities of your mind, of your heart. Talk to yourself. Truly talk to yourself. Brushing your teeth, the same thing. Taking care of yourself in different ways, the same thing. You're going to the gym. You're really thinking that you have to put your mind to it. You really have to exercise your mind over the matter. What are you trying to change? It has to have a purpose. It's not just to, oh, I need to smell better. No, it's beyond. The, the, the smelling better will be the product, but there is more to it. So we really have to take this in consideration because once we start losing ourselves, this is one of the indications right here, that if you forget about yourself and you see that eh, I'm not mistreating myself, I don't care, no, something is happening. You need intervention. <laughs> you need intervention. Number four, channeling one's thoughts and emotions towards love, compassion, justice, equanimity, and peace. Always connect. Channel, again, our thoughts and emotions towards these elements. How does that happen? Switching what comes at first. Because the first impulses are what? For us to bark, as we said, right? That's the first impulse, because you want to, things to get away from you. But how do you change it? Okay, I need to change my behavior first. Obviously, helping the other individual change, it may be a little bit harder, but if I change my behavior on how I perceive and how I can deal with and how I can project myself in the future with that individual, with myself and that situation, is a different element. And this is how we will um, get to this um, position of self-healing as well. So you apply love. Not to retaliate is also love. Not to say, not to engage in the same way, in the same manner, is love. Because we thinking that we think that love is to say, I love you, when somebody just hits you in the face. No. That's another way to, to do it, obviously. <laughs> A much harder way to do it. 
but is the not engaging is is in in itself a good way for us to start and be compassionate because we don't know what the person is going through right to be just as well and ap applying equality because if you want to be happy as much as it is hard for us to perceive as well that person also wants to be happy Joanna de Angelis brings Carl Jung uh, to the picture at the at this last um, chapter, and it's really interesting because we're going to make a connection to what he says, and we we see here science again coming along with what we have seen through through religion, uh, different religions as well, and spiritism. He says that he was possibly the one who best probed into the reality of suffering, explaining it and offering a cure. While the general concern was about physical results and emotional well-being from the medical standpoint, Jung used two methods to find its cause and solution, dreams and the imagination. And this is another area that I have to say to you. I'm not an expert. I'm not going to be an expert anytime soon. I have to study quite a, <laughs> a lot to get to understand what Jung really uh, brought to us. But it's the same method that we see with the Buddhist ideal and we see with what Jesus has brought to us over and over and over again. And we have visited many, many, many times with Christianity, which is to analyze ourselves. If we have a dream and you perceive, um, okay, I, 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 I had a dream that I was um, cutting meat, for example. I'm just giving a random thought. Think about that, 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 that what you were doing. You were holding a knife. You were cutting the meat. And you really relive that moment. And you think about it again. And you accept, even let's say for some individuals, you know, that may be something gross. Oh, cutting the meat, touching the meat and all that. Or holding a knife. No, it can be for some individual. And we get up in the morning and we find ourselves like, oh, man, I'm grossed out. I don't like to do that. And we have... But you start thinking about it. You Number one, you're facing the issue, something that you don't like to do, right? Number two, you're analyzing, again, you're imagining what's happening. So what is me, what, what is this, the connection that I have of the act of holding the knife, of cutting the meat? You may think that, okay, and where do I get to it? As you do it, as you visualize it, as you analyze it, the answers will come back because you're rescuing something that is within yourself, in the unconscious, that perhaps you need to touch on. It's you, yourself, talking to yourself. And you need to find the answer. But what happens? Sometime we get up in the morning, and we have a dream like that, and we just, oh, I had a nightmare. You push it aside. And you think it's trash. It's your unconscious talking to you. You need to sit down, take note, and you really need to dive into it. Once more, it's something that we need to dive into it more here because if she's bringing, it's not by chance. And we have seen Devaldo Franco talking about um, young in many, many occasions, but that's the essence, is for us to rescue what's inside of us. What are we thinking? Why we are thinking? And how can I use it to better, the, better myself and the environment as well? Even though he admitted that a general approach in therapy is insufficient for offering assistance, since each case is specific and requires a special therapeutic language, he nevertheless adopted the two methods effectively with positive results. We need something to complement these therapies. We saw, again, the different therapies with um, what Joanna D'Angelo brought with the uh, different chapters. Um, again, she talks about having the medical assistance, which is important. We also have to include uh, the help that we receive from one another, the support of the family, the support of the environment. And if there is something that is not going along, guess what? Put it aside until we rehabilitate ourselves or we help, help that person be re rehabilitated as well. But there is no... There is no silver bullet or a single treatment that will help the individual. It has to be something collective as well. 
At the same time, he co recommended religious support, a source of outstanding, outstanding contribution a source of outstanding contributions for the healing of the soul, where all causes of suffering originate. Individuation, and it's correct, it is individuation, which can also be utilized as individualization. And the journey towards the numinous were, were for him invaluable therapeutic dynamics for his patient's problem. Chapter 13, we talked about this idea of individualization knowing ourselves know thyself right which we say over and over here we lose ourselves because of the collective because we want to be someone else because we want to we aspire to be this or that person and we lose ourselves or sometimes the problems that are inflicted on us or we let ourselves be inflicted upon affects us and we lose ourselves. We lose our identity. I know I'm Leo Vieira, but I don't act like a millinery spirit. I forget my essence. I forget the collectiveness that I have within myself because I don't allow myself to be myself. I know it's kind of hard to even say such a thing, but it is true. It's like we're walking being pushed around by what society dictates us to do or the values that society dictates us to follow it. So we really have to get into to treat ourselves, to allow ourselves to be treated, knowing what we want to find who we are. And it's beautiful when we find a, a person, when we talk to a person, an individual, who perhaps the person we consider direct, right, can tell you what he or she likes. If you were to ask someone, what would you like for Christmas? And the person, oh, I don't know. I don't know. Just give me this. I need this. <laughs> I know my needs. It's much easier, isn't it? So we'll talk about later on what I want, okay? <laughs> but it's important for us to be decisive. If it's important for us to have, it's not to know about everything, but at least to know um, on how to respond to life. If we cannot say what we want, at least we can say what we don't want, right? Which is the what are, which are the things that makes us, you know, sad or hurts us. That's a good start. That's a good start. If we can get to the point, yes, that I want this from life or I want to become this individual, at least think about the things that you don't want. Because as you analyze the negative part and you don't let get to you, then you can get to something positive as well. Ancient Buddhist wisdom established a system of meditation, as we, as, we, as we mentioned that we would bring it again, through which health takes hold and suffering disappears. This is on chapter uh, five. And as I was saying earlier, the, the idea is for us to analyze, be in the moment on what we are doing. And it can be anything. Start small, start small by analyzing what you're doing and you repeat what you're doing. And if you're thinking about something, if you're just in a, in, in a Zen moment, um, as we see the picture here, right? Think about what you're thinking. Think about what you are thinking. It's that simple. And you start thinking, okay, I'm thinking about this. I'm thinking about this. Or if you don't wanna think about nothing, just say it to yourself. I'm not thinking, I don't wanna think about anything right now. And you repeat that to yourself. And you repeat that to yourself. You will find yourself listening to the environment much easier, what's happening, not being troubled to what's happening. I know it's, it's quite hard nowadays, but we need to try. But I'm trying to use this, I'm trying to, I'm reliving this moment here or the, these teachings um, with Joanna DeAngelis because we need to apply this to try to understand ourselves, what's going on with us. And if it is something that perhaps you're in a state that you don't know what you want, right? Or you can't get there yet, analyze the situation. And then the answers will come um, for us to act upon. But we have to know. Jesus the bearer, which is a continuation of chapter five, Jesus the bearer of complete balance, consider love as the sole cause for the optimal fulfillment of the individual. 
the subversion or absence of love for God. One's neighbor or one, oneself produces dissatisfaction, maladjustment, and imbalanced energies. Hence, the subversion or absence in the causal factor of sickness and suffering. It's a different approach that when, and, and this is a personal account, when I start studying this idea that the, that, that the Buddhist, the Buddhist ideal of understanding ourselves and meditating and, and diving into our essence, I start questioning, where is this in Christianity? But it's there. <laughs> it's there. What happened right before, just something quick, right before Jesus was given to the guards, to the Roman guards. What was he saying to everyone? And everybody fell asleep. Watch and pray. Meditation. And then we can go on, on and on and on and on. Because I start thinking, well, wait a minute, Buddhism is what? Um, I don't know how many years, huh? 500 before Jesus. And are we talking different things? Perhaps using different terms, but it's there. That's why the teachings are universal. And if we go to Jainism as well, if we go to Hinduism as well, the Sikhs, and I'm using the liberating family of religions, they teach the same thing in different ways, different aspects but they teach the same thing. And if we go to Judaism as well, we'll see similar teachings, different terminologies, but it's there. And we get lost. We take it for granted, and we think that the Zen moment is something when we are doing whatever we like to do, but it's there. So we really have to take in consideration, and I would like to bring an example for us to apply this in our lives. And I couldn't do without uh, the help of Andre Moreira in this amazing book over here. I can't remember what chapter now. It's called um, Healing and Self-Healing. Um, that he brings this passage over here that is in Mark chapter 10, verses 46 to 52. L before we read it, let me bring uh, the reason why uh, and how we can connect with this. Number one, we have the pictures of Jesus coming and helping, right? So there is a act of, of charity, right? Uh, when he is actually healing the blind. That's number one that we would like to establish because Joanna the Angels also, in one chapter, she talks about what? Altruism, helping others, reaching out to others in order to perfect ourselves, right? I know you guys are dying to read, but we'll get there. <laughs> But it's important for us to acknowledge this. Number two, we have a blind person, and he was a beggar. As Andre Morena brings to us, what is the picture of a beggar? And not, we're not saying this in a negative way. Please, don't take me wrong. But what is the, the essence of a beggar? It's someone who finds happiness from the hands of others. It's someone who can only be granted something or receive something from the hands of others. Not applying the essence within to attain what they need, to get what they need. And sometimes we can relate to that because we were waiting for something to happen. We're waiting for um, the help of others. And it's okay, but we have to go and reach out as we will see here. The passage goes like this. Then they came to Jericho as Jesus and his disciples, together with a large crowd, were leaving the city, a blind man, Bartimaeus, which means son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside begging. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many rebuked him and told him to be quiet, but he shouted all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stopped and said, call him. So they called to the blind man, saying, 
Cheer up. On your feet. He's calling you. Throwing his cloak aside, he jumped to his feet and came to Jesus. And Jesus then asked, What do you want for me? Excuse me. What do you want me to do for you? The blind man said, Rabbi, I want to see. Go, said Jesus. Your faith has healed you. Immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus along the road. First aspect of this thing. What, what is happening here? He's coming through a crowd. Imagine Jesus at the time coming with a crowd, a bunch of people. So much so that the blind man could hear it, right? So we have to acknowledge that he's coming with a bunch of people. As he's shouting to help, which is the one important aspect over here, because he already knew that a change was needed. A change was needed. When he shouted for Christ, please come and help me, he knew that he didn't want to be in that position anymore. And this is important for us because sometimes we're so embedded in the problem that we don't know what we want, even a change, because we're so perturbed by the situation with ourselves. So at least he knew that I want something. He probably did not know what the sight that he wanted to see or what he really wanted to face with his eyes would be, but at least he had a start. Now, what happens? Did Jesus come to him? No. Jesus says, go and call him. Before, actually, we also have to acknowledge that there are a bunch of people saying, be quiet. You, you don't want to disturb the master. <laughs> you don't want to disturb the master. Because sometimes when we're shouting, when we're asking for help, some people will say, no, stay there. You're fine. It's okay. No, it's not okay. If I'm shouting, if I'm asking for help, it's because I need help. I may not know what I want, <laughs> but I need help. Jesus then goes and says, go ahead and call him. Why? Because Jesus didn't want to just freely give. Jesus knew what he needed with his essence, perfect essence. Jesus knew that he needed help of some sort, right? But he allowed him to get up. As Andre Moreira, Moreira mentions in this amazing book, to throw away the cloak, right? All the things that we unfortunately see with a beggar sometimes, the luggages, the things that sometimes they have to throw that away because sometimes the attachment is, the attachment is so deep that they don't, they don't even know how to let go. And that was a, a breaking element of that situation for, her, for him to get up and say, I am of a different essence. I'm not this. And how do we relate with this? Because sometimes we also get entangled with the difficulties of life. The carry-ons of what? Guilt that we also study on chapter 13. And we carry that with us. Put our heads down, right? We feel tired. We don't know why we feel pain or limbs, but all this heaviness that he had to let go. When he comes once more, Jesus asks, what do you want? What if Jesus or your mentor, we don't even have to get to Jesus, your mentor come to you right now and say, what do you want for me? Do you know how to answer it? Do we know how to answer it? I'll be troubled a little bit. <laughs> and then I'll start thinking about my list, right? But it's important for us to get to this level of knowing ourselves, of breaking the old habits that we are shouting for help. And then when we get that help, we also know what to say. And now how to articulate ourselves, how to say it. Towards the end, we see what? That it was not Jesus. Jesus was a way. It's the same way that spiritism, other religions, other ways, other you know, sciences, um, mythologies that we would like to follow will help us right? But he was the way. What healed him was his faith. And Jesus said it. So it's not like me saying anything different, but it was the way he started vibrating. Okay, this is the chance. The master is passing by. The message, the rescue is right here in front of me. I have to do something. Despite the noise, despite people telling me that I cannot do it, 
I am an essence. I am that little light that we put on the screen as well that we can change. It's not easy, but when we look at these examples, not looking for the, 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 Christ, the Christ, the Savior, but what he brought to us, the message, the, the invitation to become a better individual. That's the true healer, right? Because the doctor is not going to just do it for you. The doctor is going to say, get up. Now you have to do your physical therapy. You have to do it for yourself. You have to strengthen your muscles, right? I'm going to give you the medicine, but you have to take with intention, and you have to get out of that cold. Nobody will do it for us. And Jesus says, get up. We are capable. We are capable. So I, I wanted to bring this example for us to really mirror ourselves with this beggar. Because when, when I was looking for an example, and I thought about it in, in many occasions, many other ways, and thank God we find this, these beautiful explanations with these other books, these other authors as well. Thank you, Andre Moreira, if you're watching, if you ever watch the talk. <laughs> but it's important for us to really take these examples and analyze and if in our meditations, if we find ourselves as the beggar, begging for favors, we need to revisit our needs. Ask is one thing. Give me the elements. Give me the way. Show me the way. What can I do? Right? And we have to be open as well that when it happens, we can attend to it. We can go with it. To finalize... The more advancement proposed by Spiritism, in addition to its extraordinary contributions in light of the fact that souls are immortal, heirs to their own acts, which, when misguided, cause suffering and reincarnation, whereby spirits purify themselves, often through suffering or irrefutable therapies for eliminating pain in humans and on the earth. Pain is harsh, but sometimes it's the way that we need to evolve, right? To grow. It doesn't mean that we should self-inflict pain on ourselves. Not, this is not what we're saying. This is not what Joanna the Angelus said through all these 14 chapters. Even though we, we, we went through a series of um, suffering um, titles and, and discussions, but it's really for us to rule, root everything out that hurts us. It's simple as that. One of the things that one of the elements that I also find interesting, um, since we're talking about this idea of reincarnation, um, and I'm gonna and I'm gonna actually spin a little bit now and put into the negative content, is the reliving or the reincarnation of the problem, if you will. I would like to call it that way. When we go through something harsh in our lives. How many times we repeat it? How many times we verbalize it, the problem, and we tell this other person, we tell that person, I'm going through this, I'm going through that, I'm going through this. And the same energy that we spend doing so, we can utilize it to change, to free ourselves. Going back to the, the um, liberating family of, of religions, as I mentioned, the, the, the Jainism, the Hinduism, and Buddhism, since we mentioned here, and Sikhism as well, they have something really interesting in common, which is karma, right? Reincarnation and liberation. Liberation from the act of reincarnating, having to reincarnate. Look how interesting this is, right? Having to reincarnate, because reincarnation, we know it's not easy. We study that the preparation for reincarnation takes a long time. We know that a lot of spirits also have the difficult reincarnating because they know they're going to have to face difficulties. And these messages that we have received through these other um, religions, they're already preparing us. So what can I do to reincarnate in a more um, positive environment? being positive within. Because no matter what happens around me, I will be positive as well. So again, I took the idea of reincarnation um, to, to put in a negative way for us to think before, do I really have to give me 
the or to inflict me the burden of reliving that issue? No. We need to think, okay, when can I take care of it? If it's not now, when? And we make a commitment. Let's say we have an issue, let's be, let's be objective. We have an issue with an individual at work. And then we know that we're going to see this individual two days from now. Can I talk to this person? Can I dive into a conversation with this individual? Yes or no? And then you start thinking, okay, I'm going to prepare myself. I'm going to disarm myself from being, you know, from, from making assumptions that this person will go this or that way. Obviously, you prepare yourself, but not being presumptions. And you try to effectively resolve this situation. Now, if I go home and I talk to my wife, I talk to my kids, or um, you know, I go home, or I stop doing this or that because that happened, and I keep reliving the situation, it's not going to resolve in number one. And number two, it's just going to be very detrimental to me and the environment as well because eliminating the pain when she says it's for us and earth. It's for the entire earth. So the more we repeat the negative, the more will happen, and the worse it will get. Suffering is temporarily, temporary by being the effect of imbalanced energy, which, if directed towards the good and love, would no longer be disrupted, fostering enlightenment, plenitude, and therefore complete health, which the Father Creator has reserved for everyone in the world for me, for each one of you, for all of us. And if anybody tells us otherwise, guess what? Unfortunately, it's not something that we should take it <laughs> because it's for all of us. Despite the differences that we have, despite the religions that we follow, God is one. Despite uh, how we perceive God, because it's something that we have also uh, talked about, right? What is, uh, how is our connection with God? What kind of relationship we have with the creator? Is it of a creator that wants us happy? All of these elements we need to insert and really dive into this, this change and find plenitude. It's not that we tomorrow will wake up, beautiful Sunday morning, and be plentiful, right? The birds are singing, <laughs> the sky is blue, no. We'll find some gray days and really dark um, moments, but it's how we're dealing with. And the beauty of it is if my day is not going so well, I can call someone and say, I need help. I don't know how to deal with this. Perhaps you have done it. I think that you can help me. That in itself is, you know, beauty right there. That is plenitude right there. Because we shouldn't know everything. We shouldn't be prepared for everything. We don't, you know, reincarnate with a manual in our hands saying, this is how you do it. Step one, two, three. I was going to say Ikea. I already said it, you know. But, you know, the manual that you go through one, two, or three, or four. It doesn't work that way. But we really have to remind ourselves that we reincarnated with a purpose. We reincarnated to be happy. Most importantly, that we are eternal and eternity waits for us to be happy. So this is the message that we would like to leave you, know, you with. And thanking everyone for the, the number of sessions, the 12 sessions that we had this amazing year of 2019. Um, more to come. We have not decided what Joanna DeAngelis book, if there will be Joanna DeAngelis, um, that we will be diving to next year. Um, but it's definitely a proposal for all of us to choose a book that we can read, to choose something that will liberate us, that will bring us plenitude. Anything that we, that we can uh, read, uh, to break the habits. Studying a little bit of the idea of rituals, which in the past I had a completely different um, idea about it. Um, it's important how we change the habits with habits. I know it, for lack of better words, this is how we would like to put it. But I was watching this um, presentation by a professor. I think he's from Columbia University. I can't remember now. He's talking about ritual in the sense of, of mundane things that we do. For example, when we say hello to one another, um, 
and we respond, oh, I'm fine. You know, the American way of, you know, greeting as we were having fun the, the last time we're here. But that's a ritual. That's a ritual that helps us break away from all the rituals that we have of thinking negative, for example. Because by the time I come in the room or I meet Chris at the elevator and Chris asks me, hey, Leo, how are you? And I have to say to him, because our norms are what? I don't want to inflict pain on this guy. I don't want to, you know, he's a nice guy. He doesn't have anything to do with my issues, right? So I say, I'm fine. Guess what? That breaks the thought pattern. We never, I, I never realized that way. I never really thought that way. But there are other rituals that we can find, right? Um, the way we follow, the way we pray, uh, the rituals of the, the, to, the, you know, again, the things that we have to do every, sing every single day of our lives. So it's important that we, with rituals, we can break the old habits, but it has to, we have to have a, a purpose uh, behind it. Um, it's much followed by Confucius as well. The, you know, Confucius names when, when they, they, he, Confucius actually uh, invites us to follow rituals, right? And, and analyze and do things ritualistic, uh, positive things, obviously, to break away from the um, madness that we create in our lives. So I think that's a nice way for us to finalize and find a way again uh, for this amazing change. I would like to open up not only for uh, questions and comments that you have about this chapter, but if you have something to say as well about the whole the discussions for, even if you were here, if you were not here for all of the discussions, uh, feedbacks and how we can apply this in our lives. I would like to hear from you. We have a couple minutes and um, who would like to be the first one? Yeah, <laughs> either Paula or Yasko. <laughs> uh, I think this last chapter was kind of a wrap up, you know, of all things. And I see the main theme or proposal or advice of Joanna is that for some way you should seek love, compassion, good feelings, good thoughts, in order to limit your suffering, if not you even to eliminate actually, you are able to eliminate your suffering. So you're right, we didn't come here, like in that Jesus, for example, says there, there. Uh, you see, uh, it's an imbalanced energy, imbalanced energy, you know, that causes the suffering. If we, you subvert love, all these good feelings, you will enter in this, you know, uh, yeah, this suffering. So I was thinking, me being in the science, scientific part, mm -hmm. it's so interesting because when I was long, that many decades ago, started to study neuro, neurobiology, we didn't know much, uh, know how the drugs will interact and would cause the benef beneficial effects, for instance. We, everybody knows adrenaline can save lives. If you, you, know, you have a heart failure, heart arrest, you have to punch with a needle, you know, a heart with adrenaline, you save the individuals. But on the other hand, if you're too much stressed, your adrenaline level stays up and it stays up for a long time, it's going to be harmful it will cause heart attack too, you know. The same is cortisol. So we start to understand that that is actually in the, our all cells membrane, that is what we call receptors, that is completely, perfectly complement to the molecule, like adrenaline. So adrenaline has a spatial, format and the, our cells has what we call receptor that really goes like a key to the key holder correctly complement. 
So a couple of decades later, was a, I was so amazed that the painkiller that I never thought I had inside my body, you know, it was there, it was proved to be there, an, a, a molecule similar to morphine. Well, we all knew for millennia that morphine would kill the pain. But we didn't know that those receptors that morphine were acting was actually made during millions of years for something that we have inside. Doesn't make sense to, to nature make something that never exists before. So they, they, they discovered the endorphins, which is much more even powerful than morphine, which we, we find outside. The same is with the cannabinoid. Now, now that is in use for certain type of pain, the endocannabinoids. So for many others, uh, other drugs that we use, like amphetamine, many things, certainly we have inside of us what we call endogenous correspondence. So what, how the prayer, meditation, love, compassion would relieve us from the pain. In my opinion, it's boosting exactly this endogenous substance that causes, that cuts the pain, causes a bliss like oxytocin, you know, causes uh, happiness, joy. So I think, see, you know, it's nothing of miracle there. We have to do all the exercise that will boost all those endogenous good substance that is behind our, you know, uh, cure or healing of suffering. Thank you for bringing this amazing example, uh, Yasko, um, because our bodies um, always is always seeking for balance, right? And we take for that for granted. Where our bodies have a way to regulate itself in such a way, and we don't have to tell it. I mean, if if you have a small wound, blood is rushed to that area to create a a you know the blood will coagulate right and stop with bleeding itself. It's it's amazing how the body responds to injuries to um, uh, problems that we create. And, and we are granted, because of our, our, our evolving capabilities, to receive a machine this way, and we take that for granted. And it's nice that you, you bring this uh, uh, idea of us finding what complements us. Me as a cell, what, what complements me or what brings me joy through prayer to whatever um, to help me liberate myself from the difficulties that I'm facing. There are many ways. I would like to bring again this, this what Joanna Dion said, because of its complex cultural um, aspect of, um, of, of um, or a structure that Spiritism brings to us, um, we can find in, itself, in it, um, you know, salvation. And when I was thinking about this idea of cultural, is, which I never really thought about it, is what Spiritism brings to us in general in complementing you know, or helping us find, uh, you know, what is in need here? Where do I, 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 I need balance, right? Because also we see that it has the religious, the moral, moral, the scientific way for a scientific mind like Yasko, she will connect with the scientific part of it, or maybe not. Maybe she's lacking, I'm just using an example, um, Yasko, just for us to complement this idea. But to me, um, reminding us, she reminds us that this cultural aspect that if anybody from anywhere in the world, for whatever culture, if they take the Spirit's book and they read it, it will be helpful. It will be culturally sensitive to that individual to read and say, eh, it makes sense. It may not take all the aspects, may not accept everything, but it will be a help to complement what is in need, right? And I think that this example that you brought, this, this comment that you brought, it begs us to do the same. 
I may not be enlightened by the religious aspect of, of Spiritism, but I know one thing, that at least the scientific part of the studies that Kardec brings to us, that we are evolving, that we are eternal, is something that complements me. Or really the religious aspect of analyzing what we have received from religious, from religions, not only Christianity, and saying, well, this I can apply to my life. So the tools is within our bodies, within ourselves, right? So we have to follow it. We have to dive into and, and really um, find the answers that we need whichever way possible. This is working? Yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> I really want to thank you for uh, bringing this book to life. And I'm very grateful for this book because Joanna has brought spiritism fully into modern times. And not that spiritism wasn't always worthy, but like the newer concepts you're talking about, it's just great to have them be active now in our conversations. And also the way you have applied um, other faiths that have walked before spiritism that you can integrate. So just to confirm what you said today or affirm it, I have something from the Edgar Casey magazine, Venture Inward. And since we're sitting in the Benjamin Franklin conference room, <laughs> I thought it might be nice to hear from Benjamin Franklin. So in Poor Richard's Almanac from January 1750, he said, there are three things extremely hard, steel, a diamond, and to know oneself. So then this article goes on, how does one come to know thyself? And you can just nod to everyone because you've discussed it all year. These days, we would say through analysis, one of your favorite words, right. <laughs> um, reflection, another one, meditation, dreams, which we may just beginning to get more familiar with dream analysis, interactions with others. So we're not supposed to be solitary monks on the hill and journaling. Certainly after interacting with others, we should follow with personal reflection. And then Casey directs us to budget more time to feeding upon the sources from which you emanate or of the spiritual and capital letters life so that the physical body, the mental body are attuned to your soul forces, your soul source, your creator, your maker, and in such a way and manner do you develop. Wow. don't have much to say about it, but to thank you. <laughs> um, it, it's, it's, it's an invitation. Um, all that we can say is it's a journey. Um, it's an, up, an, an everyday application, not easy. Um, my wife, one of my kids are here, is here, so they know. <laughs> I can't apply it every day, um, you know, very little. Um, and this is the part that at, at times, it worries me a little bit because we, we read and we, we, um, we discuss it and we say it again, we come to the Spirit to Center and it's still hard. Why? Because we have done it so many times. That's the only answer, the plausible answer that I find that gives me some hope because we have done so many times. The reaction is very natural. But to stop, think, and then respond, give it some time, it's very hard. And Joanna DeAngelo says this in throughout other books as well. It's very hard for us to stop and say, I'm not going to do this now because I know what's going to come out. <laughs> the product is not going to be p uh, positive. And we fall, we fall again in the same pit. We do it again and again and again and again. That's the problem. Now, that's why we come to the center again. That's why we hold our um, guided home meetings. That, that's why we should stop not only you know, going to these meetings, uh, but really make it a habit. Stop and contemplate life. Connect with life in whatever way possible. Um, and, and find a way, um, as, as Paula mentioned, to connect with the Creator. Hug a tree. 
because the way when we hug a tree, we're connecting with nature. Nature is a product, is creation of God. Hug another person. Hug your pet. Right, Chris? <laughs> all of the ways that we have, all of the um, elements that we have around us leads us towards this um, better life, to plenitude. Anyone else before we close? Alba. Thank you, Leo. I remember, like it was yesterday, when you announced you're go we're going to st study plenitude at the beginning of the year. Like, uh, really, I remember that. I say, oh, wow, we 12 sessions. <laughs> OK, this is session 12. That's, that's beautiful time. And thank you for bringing and do the study for us and with us. There is something that is sticking in my mind. And I don't know, in the book, Joanna gives more information, or if you know where can we find more information about dreams. Because I understand dreams is, is when you, you do that process in your brain, you know, storage information, et cetera, et cetera, that part I understand. But also the dream, when we detach from our uh, physical body and we visit sp the speed realm, which is two different situations, and which one occurs first, <laughs> I don't know, uh, things of the sort. There is really nothing more than I can recollect in terms of dreams that she mentions um, except on chapter 14. Uh, that she connects with this young aspect of or analysis of dreams, utilizing dreams um, to get to know to our subconscious um, that I can't remember now um, out of the 14 chapters. Um, but this is an aspect that, that, that truly we would like to um, dive into a little bit more. Um, the, the, the thought and... I'm, I don't want to commit yet, yet, okay? Because when we commit, we have to do it. Daniel is, you know, looking at me, he always reminds me that once we commit to something, man, let's do it. And I'm like, okay, Daniel, yes. <laughs> and he's good at it, you know, keeps us in check. But the psychology of love, right, that she talks about, you know, one of her other books that she talks about a lot of this, you know, idea of really diving within ourselves. Um, but what it is and how we, we have to utilize, I think chapter 14 is it. And us diving into the, the, the teachings that we, we get from um, Jung and other uh, psychotherapists as well um, for us to find relief with the unconscious, right? To, to, to dive into what sometimes we brush it off, you know, that, that we, we often look into the, the tip of the iceberg and we forget the, you know, the bottom, which is huge, which is immense. Um, to be courageous enough to look at these things, not be scared, uh, face what we can. Obviously, we don't want to be, you know, over courageous and then we fall into serious uh, conditions. But to really say, now I need to understand this. I need to go through this understanding bef before I can ascend. I never forget uh, teachings, uh, one teaching that we have from the book Action Reactions, that two spirits in the spirit realm, they come to a plateau in their, and I have mentioned this already here, in their evolutionary path, and they question, okay, what's happening? Where can we go beyond this? And after some insisting, they, they, their, we can call it their, um, their guides uh, tell them, look, um, if for you to go through this, there's going to be some tough moments that you have to face it. And they were brought back to the condition from many, many years before that they caused it that put them in that position of plateauing then. And they accept the challenge to reincarnate, to have a really tragic uh, um, uh, loss of life of the physical body, to ascend, to pass beyond that line. And I think this right here that we're talking about when we're analyzing our dreams, when we're analyzing this, this unconscious of ourselves, it's really hard at times. 
it's really hard at times. So um, we can dive more, um, but chapter 14 is what I can recommend if you want to read it. But obviously, as one of the Angelis does, um, as a, uh, a student of Jesus, she gives us, okay, this is where you need to go. Now we have to go and dive into it. Yes. I can just be a footnote and just take two minutes. Um, on the subject of dreams, I think the best sources are Carl Jung and the Edgar Cayce material. And the name of the book I read in college just came to me from Carl Jung in the psychology course, Memories, Dreams, and Reflections. And then the one tip I got when I took the dream course was you need a notebook by your bed. So as soon as you gain awareness in the morning, you write that dream down. You don't even really get out of bed, brush your teeth, do anything. So you're training your brain to do a better recall. And then I just got a very helpful dream dictionary. There's more than one of them. But this was from Dr. Michael Schwartz in San Antonio, Texas, a naturopath. He gave you some reasons for the frequent symbols, but what he emphasizes is you're finding the meaning, not just getting a symbol with a definition. And to understand, you're co-creating that dream. So when you have a nightmare or something unpleasant, they're the harder ones to take apart. But boy, is it worth it. Thank you. Yeah, it's important to say that you know uh, the symbol or the 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 reason why we're going through is different for each one of us. So if I dream about snakes, it's yeah. different reason why somebody else. Would, so, but thank you. That is definitely a great book, um, Daniel. Thank you, Leo. Good job. Twelve session, the whole book. Um, and more. Yes, this is just the beginning. I think. Isn't it? You already commit with, I heard like psychology of gratitude over there. I'm just kidding. So first of all, thank you so much. I think uh, our community have enjoyed this um, 12 months. And I believe that the book is more deep in terms of knowledge because you brought here basically highlights of the book. So it doesn't mean that we cannot go back and also read the book. Uh, quick comment on the dreams. The Spirit's book, there is a section in the Spirit's book, part two, that talks about the emancipation of the soul. I think give a nice baseline or highlight what this, this dream in spiritism. It's not something miraculous because we are spirit. We, every day we emancipate, we go to the other side. Well, if we are here incarnate, we don't know ourselves enough What's the guarantee that going to the other side and come back with the filter of our brain, we're going to have the certainty of what our brain is, is going to be, it's going to tell us. So I, I think it is important to we be worried about dreams because it's our activity as a spirit during the time that we're asleep. But I think the big invitation for us is to get to know ourselves in the awakening moment that's right now in our relationship with father so it's just for us that you know i believe that you know all other philosophy has its um how do you say truth on this subject but in spirit is very clear it's clear cut there is no like um miraculous things it's just like look your dream is a reflex of your life, in this side or in the other side. But where are we going to concentrate um, to fix our problem or to stop to suffer? Or how we can find this awareness that we are looking to, to stop to suffer, to uh, release our suffering? So I think it would be more in this awakening moment. So that's just a final comment. Thank you, everyone. And for all your comments and your presence here as well throughout these 12 sessions. Unfortunately, I could not ask uh, Joanna DeAngelis to be here with us tonight physically. She's, she, she, I'm, I'm quite sure that she here, she's here uh, spiritually and with a lot of messengers as well to help this mind and this heart to convey some of the messages. 
Um, it's not easy. But we were able to invite someone very special um, to at least say the final prayer for us tonight. He's not going to give a talk. He's not here for a talk this week. He's here to help us in a different way, an elevated way as well. But Adriano is here with us. <laughs> Adriano is here with us. And um, uh, Daniel, uh, we, we are joking and you know, very serious. Um, we committed to ask him to say the final prayer and, um, and enlighten us with his voice.